I became involved with, initially with FCCS uh, at the University of Pennsylvania uh, about five years ago. And at that time, what I was trying to do was improve the education offered in critical care, mostly to our residents and to our nursing staff. Uh, and I quickly realized that I didn't have really the time or the resources to sit down and write or create a well-done, evidence-based, fairly exhaustive curriculum for critical care. And I looked around to see, well, what is already available and what, what can I just simply use? And that's how I discovered FCCS. And I quickly realized that this course is readily adaptable, really to various degrees of um, personnel. It is easily adaptable to the resident level <clears throat> and the nursing level. As time went by, we morphed it a bit and made it more relevant to our fellows as well. The idea came from the fact that we were taking care of patients who were cared for by someone else first. And that first person to see that sick patient was not an intensivist. It was a family practitioner. It might be a nurse. Uh, it might be a doctor in their office. It might be a surgeon who's not skilled in intensive care. And we realized that how they cared for that patient made a difference in what we were able to do as intensivists. So we felt that this course would fill the gap of knowledge, giving that first responder the tools to take care of that patient and to get them to the ICU, to get them to the intensivist in better shape. The overall goal has always been to improve patient care and improve patient outcomes. The role for FCCS is typified by a story I recently heard from an instructor candidate that was in a course with me. He told me that he was getting frustrated with getting telephone calls from colleagues asking him to see a patient who was described as stable. He walked in the room and saw multiple signs that the patient was moving rapidly down a pathway of evolving critical illness and he was frustrated that his colleagues didn't see the same warning signs. FCCS really has grown out of the recognition that there are some key warning signs that help us anticipate critical illness. You can take these basic principles and teach nurses, physicians, respiratory therapists, medical students on what is important in recognition of the critically ill or what is important when you're facing a disaster, whether it's a large-scale disaster or whether it's a 10-car uh, pileup and you just happen to get 15 patients in your emergency room or in your hospital and you usually get only one or two. I think that it brings, it, it breaks it down very uh, stepwise and we give in these courses a, a lot of material that can be used in a variety of ways. Um, and they can be used before or they can be used just in time. I've given the course both um, uh, as for the FCCS course almost as a review course for interns uh, who in Haiti who want the most up-to-date um, information on patients they, they see every day but don't really know how to do. I've given the course in short term preparing for a disaster on a, on a military hospital ship uh, recently uh, uh, in Haiti uh, after Hurricane Irene. So you can use it really any way you, you want. What we see on, at the time we do a course is the enthusiasm. The confidence that comes from this course, it says, you know, I can do that. We hear about it. We hear back from people saying, you know, everybody says we need this here, now we need it here. They just want to take it everywhere. So I think the feedback we get is that it's met their needs, and the fact that they feel that it has met their needs tells me that I'm sure their care has improved. Well, the first thing I would do is encourage anybody who wants to be involved with FCCS to get involved. It's a very, very easy thing to do. Uh, the society's doors are wide open. The way I did it, I think, is the easiest way of doing it, which is to simply attend the Congress and take the one-day FCCS course. It reduces a two-day curriculum to a one-day curriculum, which is always nice. It's geared for people who want to become instructors and directors. And so you tend to get some pearls that you may not otherwise get. You'll be exposed to the leaders of FCCS at the Congress, and so that's always helpful for points of contact. And the society is very good about working with a prospective course director to implement the course. 
they'll need to get a course consultant who's an expert in the course to come by and sanction the course. I think that's a very useful thing to do. The course consultant can help the director not just implement the course, but can actually teach a few of the sessions him or herself and demonstrate maybe different nuances of how to go about teaching uh, the course. Ultimately, I think the success of the course, however, rests on its multidisciplinary design. So I would strongly encourage any course director to have both a multidisciplinary cadre of instructors to choose from and also advertise the course to a multidisciplinary audience. We routinely had respiratory therapists, pharmacists, nurses, advanced practitioners in our course in addition to doctors who came from the resident level, the fellow level, and even the attending level. And similarly, I, my, attending, my, I'm sorry, my instructor list was the same. I would have nurse practitioners lecturing all the time. I had uh, people in their relevant areas of expertise. I had respiratory therapists who would teach about non-invasive positive pressure. That, that made the course fun and relevant. For me, I think that these courses are so useful, whether in the United States or in places where all they have is IV fluid and can take a pulse and they have nothing else. That still, it translates for both places. Peter Saffer from Pittsburgh, uh, one of uh, our idols at University of Pittsburgh, basically said, it's an ICU, an ICU does not have walls. It's basically a continuum of care. And I think that's what the FCCS, FDM, and the PFCS courses do. Uh, and I, I, I really, I teach them all the time and I think they're great courses.